you just got to look at Texas and the snow, snow and ice storm uh, earlier this year. Um, it doesn't take much to bring a community to its knees. That's totally right. I, it's the house of cards, you know, where uh, the more awesome things get and the more technologically advanced and the more people there are that use those things, the easier anything can go wrong. I think, you know, one little uh, wrench in the, in the works there. And it's stuff that maybe the, the professionals in that industry should have seen coming, but somehow they don't see coming. So we're never going to have ice storms in Texas. Why would we even bother taking the most bait? Oh, now we have ice storms in Texas and everyone's screwed. And people up in like Michigan were feeling kind of like smug about it. Like, huh, you guys don't even know how to live through a 20 degree day. Well, they have no infrastructure for it. They have no experience in it. They've got no, their blood isn't even probably conditioned for it. I don't know. Uh, whereas any house in, in Michigan's probably got a closet that is floor to ceiling, extra blankets. And, you know, half the houses have a fireplace or a wood stove or, or something, anything. Um, so we can't even put ourselves in the shoes of, uh, of somebody in the, in the deep South that suddenly has to deal with that. And, uh, yeah, I just like if, if suddenly we hit 120 degree Fahrenheit during the day in the summer, we'd probably have people dropping like flies from that. You know, our, our blood is thick like oatmeal up here. <laughs> Keep us warm. We Get Outdoors Nation, today's a first for the podcast. Um, and it's a topic that actually is really close to my heart. In fact, I've just spent a vast quantity of money moving 12 hours across the country from where I was to where I am now. <laughs> There's secret covert words in there. Um, because of the topic that we're talking about tonight and the topic we're talking about this evening, well, um, we have a gentleman here who, who owns the YouTube channel Great Lakes Prepping. And tonight we're going to talk about what if shit goes wrong and What's the scale of shit going wrong? Like from a puncture in your car through to aliens invading from Mars and everything in between. So, um, uh, GL, welcome to the uh, welcome to the Week Outdoors podcast. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. Ah, it's awesome. Now, prepping's a very funny topic. Um, it polarizes people. Some people say you don't need to prepare for anything. Other people will be buy, be off buying themselves a ex nuclear silo and spending thirty million dollars on putting swimming pools in it or whatever else. <laughs> um, what what was your journey into recognizing the fact that maybe the world isn't as secure as we're all led to believe, and that prepping would be a thing that was going to be on your agenda? Uh, well, I'm sure it was uh, a series of circumstances and I guess factors. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't raised in an environment that was big on prepping or survivalism, but there was always sort of a hint of the idea that self-reliance is important. My father is a, a Vietnam War veteran, and there was always that sort of sense of um, being able to sort of take care of yourself when others can't. Uh, you know, then there's the sort of notion that when you need help, when you need the police or, or fire or ambulance, uh, when you need them now, they're only half an hour away. So you have to think about what you can do for yourself. And then to expand on that, uh, if there's a much bigger problem and everybody needs help, um, that can quickly you know, lead to nobody getting any help. So uh, it's sort of just taking a little bit of ownership of your own destiny and um, paying attention to, I think, basic preparedness measures that aren't necessarily even uh, especially extreme or controversial, unless you decide to think of them that way. There was one specific catalyst that really sort of uh, kicked my interest up a notch. And uh, that's in, um, I believe it was uh, 2001 or 2003, maybe. There was a massive uh, electrical blackout across the Northeast United States and parts of Canada. There was some flaw in the power grids that all communicate with one another, and they just started falling like dominoes one after another. And there'd never been such a large amount of people without power, um, maybe ever. And um, my area was quite lucky. We all had power back within a few days. Some people weren't so lucky. 
Um, I lived on the outskirts of Detroit at the time and having no gas uh, in the car, really not much food uh, outside of the refrigerator. That was starting to be a problem even at, by the second day, uh, middle of summer, you know, 90 degrees out. Nobody's going to enjoy that. And being uh, maybe the geographical location I was in, I was starting to notice a little bit of unraveling of, of things. Even by the second night, there were reports of looting and things like that. Um, luckily, the power came back on within a couple more days. Things normalized pretty quickly. But it was a big eye opener about how incredibly unprepared I was for just anything, just the most basics of things. Uh, I had a couple bags of chips in the cupboard. Everything else was refrigerator food, which we basically grilled up the first night just so it wouldn't go to waste. <laughs> um, no gas in the car. I couldn't have even made my way to some place for salvation if I wanted to. Uh, no no supply of any means to really defend the house if any trouble came to me and you know i was quite quite a bit younger then and i didn't have the same motivation or resources that i that i eventually had that i could dedicate more sort of thought and time to um but over the years i i just started thinking about it more and more and and it, there wasn't one massive big thing like today I'm spending my life savings on a bunker and a farm and who knows what else. It was really just a gradual ramp up a couple of extra cans of soup at the grocery store. And then once you, you know, you kind of graduate to the next level of, all right, if my power goes out, I don't even have a simple generator. Okay. I've got the generator. What if it lasts for a week and there's no gas at the gas stations? Okay. Well now I, I can think about a solar backup to the backup just that kind of thing over a long period of time. And um, eventually I just, I think I had a lot in my brain to talk about. And I thought I'll make a YouTube channel because that's what you do nowadays. And it was really, there was really no uh, big aspirations or ideas of what that would turn into. I thought, oh, there's a few people out there that might be interested. And, um, you know, I'm still kind of a little guy in the terms of YouTube, but just in the last couple of weeks, we've uh, reached uh, 20,000 subscribers, which for me, starting off with Hell no yeah. ideas of anybody caring what I have to say, that's it's pretty awesome for me. And uh, it's, it's an honor that there's at least 20,000 people that liked what I have to say enough to want to hear more. Um, I, I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's the quick rundown of kind of how, how it all came to be. And how do you how do you manage all that? Because there's a is there not a danger of becoming super anxious and paranoid about every threat that possibly you could ever experience, and like then needing to wrap yourself up in cotton wool and hide in the corner and cry? Because <laughs> that stroke strikes me as like your mind could go that way. Absolutely, that is that is that is a definitely a real thing, and some people certainly go that direction. Um, and, and you can't, uh, unless you've got millions of dollars, you know, um, I, I've, I've used the, the sort of hypothetical that if Bill Gates wanted to, he could create his own enclosed dome city patrolled by AI, you know, death robots and have his own uh, permaculture and, and, you know, he could live off the main grid and, and on his own for, you know, forever if you wanted, but the average person, you know, you can descend into madness if you get too tied up into it. And, and I definitely don't really um, think about it in those terms. I acknowledge that something could happen uh, in my lifetime that would be sort of the end times. There could be a much worse plague that sweeps the world. There could be a uh, a solar flare, who knows what stuff that I'm not smart enough to fully understand. There could be something that sends us to the dark ages. And no matter how good of a prepper I could ever be, uh, I'm not going to survive all that. I'll probably last a few weeks longer than most people, but the, like, I can't live my life expecting that I'll be able to cheat that level of destiny. <laughs> so, you know, beside, uh, instead of going for the bunker and the, you know, full off grid and everything. I look at things more like, um, what if something kind of serious happens? 
something that nobody's prepared for. And I could now be in a position that's uh, a lot better. And the perfect example, and there's no better example in my lifetime than uh, March of last year when the pandemic really kind of hit and everybody started to realize what it was and everybody in the United States lost their damn minds and started hoarding toilet paper and buying everything else out at the grocery stores. Um, you couldn't find a, uh, like a, like a freezer or a chest, a chest freezer or anything like that. Those are all purchased up meat, everything. I'm sure the same was, uh, in a lot of places. And, uh, I, I never had to rush to the grocery store to be amongst the apparently plague infested mobs of people to try to get an extra loaf of bread or, or some, some toilet paper. Um, I just, I was stocked before that. And there, some people say preppers are the reason for the, the panic buying and the, the, we couldn't find anything. And that's the opposite of true. It was every, it was everybody who had zero preparation that was out panic buying. We gradually bought for 10 years leading up to this thing or however long. Mm. And so I, I never, I did go to the grocery store sometimes just to, you know, see how, see what was going on and see if there was anything I wanted, but I didn't need anything um, for, for maybe months between the various uh, sort of food backup I have. Um, but yeah, the idea that I could store grains and beans and, uh, all that forever. Um, it's, it's, it's unlikely it, it can happen. People homesteaders, people live off the grid. They live on a small farm. They can sustain themselves for years, but that's when the rest of society outside of their gates is functioning. Normally, if we have a full, uh, walking dead scenario, um, I mean, we're, we're all toast. If an, if a meteor hits us, we're toast. So I can't, I can't waste my, my life or my brain being anxious about that. Um, but I am a little bit of an anxious person. So that did, uh, inspire the, the measures that I do take and, um, and, and it's paid off in, la in the last year. And I, and I saw there was a conversation I, I was involved in on online around the time when all that started. And someone was like, man, I bet you preppers are just loving this. This must just be your dream come true. And I had to explain like, well, I can't speak for every prepper, but what I do is a, it's kind of a product of, of anxiety that maybe I wish I didn't have, but I do. And I, I do this to mitigate uh, the feelings of that anxiety. So when something like this actually happens, it means that my fears have been realized and that's no, I'm not really that happy about this. Uh, I'm more prepared to deal with it than maybe your average person, but I know I'm probably more scared than the average person too. So I don't know. It's a, hmm. uh, it's a toss up either way, but no, you can definitely go way too far down the rabbit hole. And there's a lot of, I discuss this a lot. There's a lot of different sort of categories of prepper. I'm more of the, food preservation guy, you learn how to grow tomatoes and then can them, uh, then I am the militia ultra survivalist, um, even sort of anti-government conspiracy guy. I've got a, I got a little touch of all that in me, I'm sure, but that's not what my focus is. And that's not definitely not what my channel is about. It's very apolitical and it's, 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 uh, these days it's way more food oriented. How can you um, uh, grow food, save food, prepare food. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's more of a DIY channel than anything else. Hmm. Uh, how can you do things yourself at home? Uh, be it, um, establish a solar backup power source for your house or how to make this kind of bread that you only thought you could buy at a specialty store, you know, the, it's just DIY. And that's, that's the name of the game for, for preppers and preparedness. Um, yeah, it it amazes me um, how many people I I know and I work with I've worked for actually who wander around the world in a degree of ignorant bliss, and then they're very surprised that their car breaks down in the snow and there's no cell phone network and they get hypothermia and end up in hospital because they're frozen <laughs> their ass off, and 
they they look around and say oh, every, everything's to blame. It's the cell phone network. It's the <laughs> this. It's the that. It's the whatever else. And but the, the reality was they did cho- choose to go and drive in freezing cold conditions from point A to point B through a, a, a maybe a semi remote part of their state or their county. And um, yeah. uh, in the knowledge that you know we get punctures and cars break down and. I, I think prepping can get a bad name, but if you chunk it backwards to like logically, what are things that everybody experiences once every 12 to uh, once every one year to five years, you know, your, mm-hmm. your, vi- your vehicle breaking down is, is something you're likely to experience within a five year window. And it, it, no matter even if it's in the best of conditions, it's still going to suck. Do you know what I mean? You're still going to be late. You're still going to have to communicate. You're still going to need liquid. Um, And and I don't know. I I, I wonder whether people need to go and read the news more often and um, like actually analyze what it is they're doing and where it is they're going to. Um, I, I love your style. Like you're not looking to, consider a solar flare or a meteor hitting you none of us have enough cash to survive that but <laughs> it's that practical day-to-day stuff where stuff can go upside down yeah that's exactly it um the stuff that's more likely to happen job loss uh if you have food that can last you a month well that's one less thing you have to try to worry about buying if you have no income for a while um a, a, a several day power outage in your town um, are you going to lose all your food? If it's the winter time, are you going to be cold? Uh, that kind of stuff. Um, like I mentioned before, the, the pandemic did kick everyone's awareness up a notch and my channel, as well as every other sort of prepper related media thing out there, I, I know saw a massive bump over that year because millions of people that never even thought about it because just ignorant bliss. Uh, suddenly wanted to learn a little more about it. And I'm sure that um, every different category of prepper got some new recruits over that year, um, be it uh, the, the, the tomato canning people or the, the militia people. Uh, but no, I, there's definitely a lot of factors at play. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of horrible stuff going on in the world as there always is. But by and large, for the average sort of first world person, um, life has never been easier in a physical sense. Mm. Um, meaning, uh, we have technology that does so much for us and it's also a constant distraction and our minds are filled with social media and memes and, and news. I think there's a news overload. Um, but I, I believe that, uh, in the previous generations, um, struggle, uh, led to knowledge and uh, um, ability. Um, you know, I, I won't speak for anyone else, but my dad and my grandpa and my uncles, they all knew how to fix everything on a car or at least their own car. Um, they could repair whatever around the house, at least good enough to, until the real professional could get there. Um, you know, you, you just, you had a basic understanding of, kind of just how to live and how to survive with basic failures of things. And uh, I don't blame like it's the millennials for being lazy. No, it's, 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 it's a certain, it's the circumstances. Um, you know, it, it's Gen X was, you know, ramped up into the technology world and they didn't bother having to learn about repairing their own car as much as their, you know, fathers or grandfathers would so then in turn they're not teaching their uh i don't know generation z kids how to work on cars or or fix plumbing or any of that so um it's just the i think the, a natural progression of our very tech oriented existence and modern life uh you know compounded by the whole um, supply system is sort of based on this just in time supply concept where you don't have to waste any extra warehouse space. If our logistics software can make sure that the truck always shows up just as the store runs out of whatever. Well, that obviously is something that we're, we're, we're seeing, um, 
downfall of nowadays because the, the, the supply chain has been so disrupted. But uh, if you're hungry, you run out to the, uh, the, the fast food. If you, if you want a coffee, you run out to Starbucks. Anything you want, you can just go and get. Well, nowadays, you can just use your phone and they'll bring it to you for a nominal fee. Um, and and it's, it's, it's all cool. I enjoy a lot of that same stuff. I don't want modern way of life to go away. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, fantasize or fetishize the walking dead world where I could be a, uh, a zombie warlord or whatever those guys are. And there are people that definitely fantasize about that sort of thing happening. No, I really like the modern conveniences. It's just, uh, I think about what would happen if I didn't have all of them. Mm. Um, I can make coffee at home and and fix a, a leaking pipe if it's spewing water all over my house. And, and I've witnessed people, even my own age, that just freeze up and, and basically resolve to be defeated immediately. Like, I guess this is just my life now. My house is underwater and I have no coffee. And, um, and I, I really, I really uh, respect the people that um, my age or younger that go out of their way to, be homesteaders or do things that are very much more self-sufficient because it's so much work and, uh, and they see the value in knowing those things. Mm. Uh, and, and that's sort of my ultimate objective is to um, sort of become a homesteader. I think that's the natural progression of preppers. Either you become a homesteader or you become, I don't know, a mission, a militia uh, fanatic of some sort. I don't know. I've I've personally just joined the homesteader category. By the way, I've just bought a, I've just bought a place, a property, house, enough space for animals and vegetables, and uh, fishing and hunting in the lit local area. It's uh, yeah, that's I, great. I, I've I've gone down I've gone down that well not that rabbit hole. Um, I, I suppose what, something I'm very curious about is, you know, to 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 actually be a prepper or to actually prepare yourself. You've got to look into the crystal ball of the future a little bit and suss out what do you think actually could happen to me where I live that will take away some of those modern conveniences that I'm so used to. It could be the power for a couple of days. It could be um, even four road traffic accidents within a 10 mile radius of each other. And then you break your leg and you need a, an ambulance. There won't be an ambulance. Mm. I mean, there, there's, there's some very, what 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 do you see the potential being for for i don't know i say shit going wrong i suppose would be a way of phrasing it but um what 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 do you think in your mind is real and what do you think is hocus pocus or i won't say unreal but i don't know if you know what i mean like what what what's reality what could we actually experience in the next 10 years um that maybe people should be thinking about and considering uh, yeah, uh, a big one, a common one amongst uh, preppers uh, in a discussion much like this is uh, uh, economic instability. Um, and that's not and that's nothing new. It's just something that the younger generations, really, including myself, have never truly experienced. Uh, not just instability of the American dollar or what have you, but um, people experiencing massive unemployment, um, hunger, uh, homelessness, all those things. And, uh, you know, those are things that are that my parents and grandparents, I mean, living through, living through the, the great depression and everything else, that was all very real stuff. Um, before them, the, the, you know, the dust bowl and all that stuff. Uh, but that's something that, that could happen again. And, um, there will be plenty of people that are doing just fine because there always is, but there's going to be a lot of people that aren't. And, and that leads to um, not just sort of a humanitarian crisis, but crime is going to go up because uh, I don't care who you are. You're about four missed meals away from becoming a criminal. And, and that's if I'm starving to death, I will steal. I'll steal food before dying. And everyone who's a parent is about one hungry baby away from being anything, any unspeakable thing, because they have that one priority. 
and uh and it, and it's it's understandable i don't it's not it's not pleasant it's not nice but it's not surprising uh so i think economic instability compounded by uh climate crisis and that maybe that's maybe that's hopefully a little more than 10 years off but there's going to be migrations of people so you're going to have more people condensing into fewer spots and uh just in case anyone you know is looking at flooding towards michigan i just i just looked out back and our lakes are actually all empty totally dry no more water don't even know how huh bone dry no water here try uh, i don't know arizona um, but no, there's going to be migrations to places that uh, are further inland as the sea levels rise, places that have water. I, I've actually uh, read quite a bit about the water crisis in parts of South Africa, hmm. and it's it's pretty grim. It makes me really happy. I live well in the, in the place that used to have a lot of Great Lakes around it. <laughs> I mean, um, in, Cape, in Cape Town here, they got within. Um, six hours of day zero where there's no water left, like literally six wow. hours. And um, already there was neighborhoods that hadn't had running water in their house for eight months at that point in time. Mm. And you're, you're walking down the street to a, a is it a Bowser, like a, a big water tank to go and get your, mm. get your water. And then it's rationed. Um, wow. And you can't flush your toilet, can't shower. Um yeah, I mean, and they they literally got hours from it. Um, uh, and there's a few other places in South Africa now. Um, uh, there's a town called Grahamstown in on the east coast of South Africa here that is very, very, very close to that now. Um, mm. You know, I think I think they're allowed five toilet flushes a day. That's like the number. Um, and, and yeah, showering and whatever else. In fact, I bumped into a guy from there the other week, and uh, he was up exploring where I've where I've the property I've bought, or in the sort of community up there. And I'm like, oh, what's the best thing about being here? He said, I had a five minute shower. <laughs> wow, that's it. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's I, I, I suppose uh, I'm, I, I live in a third world country, so I suppose I'm a, more of a raw edge to where things can go can go wrong. I mean, we do without electricity frequently here. The, the grid is, right. the, the grid is sometimes hours from complete collapse. And yeah. um, you just got to look at Texas and the snow, snow and ice storm uh, earlier this year. Um, it doesn't take much to bring a community to its knees. That's totally right. I, it's the house of cards, you know, where uh, the more awesome things get and the more technologically advanced and the more people there are that use those things, the easier anything can go wrong, I think, you know, one little uh, wrench in the in the works there. And it's stuff that maybe the the professionals in that industry should have seen coming, but somehow they don't see coming. So we're never going to have ice storms in Texas. Why would we even bother taking the most bait? Oh, now we have ice storms in Texas and everyone's screwed. And people up in like Michigan were feeling kind of like smug about it. Like, huh, you guys don't even know how to live through a 20 degree day. Well, they have no infrastructure for it. They have no experience in it. They've got no, their blood isn't even probably conditioned for it. I don't know. Uh, whereas any house in, in Michigan's probably got a closet that is floor to ceiling, extra blankets. And, you know, half the houses have a fireplace or a wood stove or, or something, anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't even put ourselves in the shoes of, uh, of somebody in the in the deep south that suddenly has to deal with that and uh yeah i just like if if suddenly we hit 120 degree fahrenheit during the day in the summer we'd probably have people dropping like flies from that you know our, our blood is thick like oatmeal up here <laughs> keep us warm <laughs> well it's maybe thick like cholesterol from the, the bacon and the cheese and all that i don't know uh, <laughs> It's a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird. So, so we've got like there is a reality of a potential of economic instability, um, but and you can go that on a macro basis, like a whole government basis. But economic instability is just losing your job, right? That's that's sure. economic instability. If uh, mm -hmm. if you can't pay your home loan or your or your rent, and you can't pay your bills, and you can't pay for your car and your insurances and whatever else. Um, 
well, you, you, you're almost as screwed as that as though the whole of the finance world collapses on you. I mean, it's th- th- there's not that much difference. Um, yeah. What what about um, the impact of government are on the population of the country? How do you see that playing out? Uh, that's a that's a tricky one. I, I think that's something, at least maybe in my lifetime, that we'll continue to see on a local, more isolated sort of basis. Like uh, when there's a very controversial uh, trial happening and the people really disagree with whatever the verdict or the judgment was, there's protests, uh, sometimes riots. Some of that stuff spins out of control. And if you're if you just happen to live in one of those neighborhoods, all of a sudden for that week or whatever, you're living in a war zone that you had nothing to do with creating um, just through circumstances that were unrelated to your own life. Uh, and then you have, I don't know. I think that at least I can only speak for the U S um, we like to, we have, we have ideals about how it's sort of the people's country and we founded it. And, we, uh, the whole system is built. So if the people don't like it, we can overturn it. And um, that's not realistic. Even if there was a very, very righteous reason to do so, um, it's not realistic because uh, the, the government's, the government's always going to win. People well, aren't going to like you're, to You're that. a full blown civil war at that point in time, aren't you? I mean, that's the. Yeah. And, and anyone that, fantasizes about that is also crazy because um there's there's nothing there's nothing anybody wants about that uh i mean even even combat veterans who've seen the hell of war um they did eventually get to go home but you can't go home at the end of the day if the war is where you live uh yeah there's there's nothing about that anybody wants and i think that it's within the realm of possibility that that sort of thing could happen in the future of this country but i don't i i don't see it happening anytime in my lifetime. I just, it's just, it's just, I don't think it could isolated incidents. You know, I'm sure uh, everyone around the globe got to see our really proud moment on uh, January 6th, this, uh, this last year where, where um, some, some misguided folks decided to try to storm a government facility and, what whatever your political beliefs are, uh, I don't know how anybody doesn't agree that that was probably uh, a poor idea. Mm. Um. Anyway, I don't. I, I try. I try pretty hard to 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 not get deep into politics because it's not productive, and uh, it only leads to uh, descent into chaos, and and nothing really productive can come of that. Uh, at least in the context of what I talk about on my channel. Yeah. But I mean, it does, it does have, it does have an impact. Um, if they, if they keep printing cash um, and uh, we, we are going to see rapid inflation, that's a logical, um, you know, you, you ba- basically you're borrowing from who God knows from where, but you're borrowing um, that, that will drive inflation that will rise the cost of things that will have a knock on ripple effect. And that's, um, and then you mentioned climate a little while ago, and we, uh, I, I, despite what every what a lot of people say, I uh, the, the climate is changing. If we if we don't if we forget about apportioning blame about who's responsible for it changing and just say it's adapting, it's it's changing. Um, we we need to be more prepared for it changing. Um, we we are going to, as you said, we are going to face sea levels rising. It's already happening. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's crazy. Um, yeah, go on, jump in. Tell me. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I I like the way that you put it. Where all right, let's forget about who's to blame if it's nature or us. But it's happening, and we do have to adapt to it. And if that means not contributing as much carbon as we currently are, well, that's one thing. My opinion is. It's never going to happen. Not in my lifetime. We're not going to do it until society is either at the point of near extinction to where we'll finally be scared enough to change our actual way of life or some new technology is created that uh, changes the game and creates clean energy and clean vehicles and everything else. 
and all of those new technologies can somehow defeat the existing oil and coal lobbies. <laughs> if that can all happen, which again, not in my lifetime, if I had to guess, uh, then maybe we have a chance. But in the meantime, no, it's going to keep getting more and more grim. And has my day-to-day -day life changed much? I read the news reports. It's getting so much worse, so much worse. Well, I don't live on a tiny island country, so I don't see little beaches getting smaller. Like, yeah, I guess the gardening season is weird these days. You know, uh, in, in Michigan, we've gotten more ticks. Mm -hmm. You know, the little arachnids that give you Lyme disease. We've had more ticks in the last five, 10 years than ever. We ne I never saw a tick in my life till about six years ago. And now... You can't even walk around up in the sort of northern half of the state without finding ammonia. And, uh, and that's just nuts. Like it's insanity how many ticks there are. And that's because their breeding season is longer. And uh, they can survive almost the entire winter without sort of dying off or whatever they do when it's below freezing. Um, so, no, it, there's, there's definitely different things happening. But is it really affecting my life right now? No, not really. But what would affect my life? And I'm just speaking as sort of a selfish consumer American. Um, I like driving my truck and nobody makes an electric truck that I really like. Plus, then I'd have to get an electric thing installed in my garage. And now I still can only drive up 100 miles. Or... No, I just want to keep my gasoline truck forever. Um, I still want to take uh, you talked about a five minute shower and it made me cry a little inside. My shower lasts as long as my hot water tank is, is big. Mm. And that's about a, it's, I could take an hour shower if that's what, what interested me. <laughs> it's a huge waste of water, but like, I, I wouldn't have to give it a second thought if that's what I wanted, but that's not going to be the case in the next couple of generations. Mm. Like, I think that my, uh, well, I don't have children, but if I had children, my grandchildren would probably be living with a lot of struggle in their life compared to. Uh, I have a pretty easy going life, actually, um, in, in, in regards to things like the climate affecting my, my world. Mm. Um, so, no, I don't I don't think humanity is going to change in, in how much we'd have to change so quickly. Quit eating beef. Quit driving electric cars. No more cruises. Sorry, you can't fly to Phoenix to see your grandma because that air that 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 plane ride is just absolutely frivolous. Like all that has to go away or at least be massively reduced. And uh, we're not going to do it. Um, it's, it's human nature to not really see much past your own uh, sort of world, your own existence. And, and I'm guilty of that as anyone. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I think except for the most hardcore sort of activists and, and, and climate scientists and stuff, I just don't think anyone's on board yet. I agree. And, and I like what you say there about time. Um, I've, observed, I've observed for a long time that often the people who have the most successful but the, and the most well-balanced and, and quite frequently the happiest of lives, most contented of lives maybe, um, are actually people who can um, look into that crystal ball about what, what the future is likely to hold for a, a period of time. And, um, and objectively appreciate it. They might not like it, but they can objectively appreciate it. They go, I, I don't like the fact that X is likely to happen, but I have to put that to one side because it is likely to happen. You know, it's a six or seven out of 10 likelihood, which means it's, that's, that's, that's pretty high in guessing what the future is yeah. going to bring to you. Um, and one of the things that strikes me at the moment is, um, in my preparation for this conversation is I was shocked at the number of the world's rich and famous who are building their prepping plan Bs. They are built buying properties in New Zealand. Um, oh, yeah. Very I mean, you've got Elon Musk. Elon <laughs> Musk is arguably the world's most like dedicated prepper because that guy's going to have a homestead on Mars. Um, you know, <laughs> um, those people must know something to warrant them spending that much money, time, effort, and thought on becoming a New Zealand resident, buying a big plot of land, sticking a bunker underneath it, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, you mentioned Bill Gates. He is one of them. Um, do you think they know something we don't? Well, I, I agree with the concept 
But here's why I think that maybe they don't. Um, if you had a hundred billion dollars, that's that's that money. Money is just meaningless. Mm. Uh, you could buy a Ferrari every second of your life, and you'd never run out of money. Um, so when you're that rich, anything that you want can just be a whim. He could say to his assistant, you know, uh, uh, Bill Gates. I know the the guys who who uh, started Google. They've got their New Zealand bunkers going. Um, they could just say to their assistant, "Hey, uh, I want a crazy doomsday civilization in a bunker in New Zealand, and just make it the best thing that's ever been built ever, w- with no no expense spared." Go. Well, now it's that assistant's hassle. And now uh, Bill Gates or whoever, they don't even have to think about it again. And then two years from now, their guy comes back and says, all right, your amazing underground uh, city is completed and uh, you can go visit it now. And he's like, cool, I'll go. It's just when money is meaningless, you can just have anything. And so why not mitigate any possible scenario if it, if it, uh, relatively speaking, doesn't even cost you anything? Mm. So they, yeah, so they they can afford to, well, they they, they can afford to mitigate absolutely any possible risk because they if if it costs Jeff Bezos five hundred million dollars, he'll have it back in three weeks' time anyway through the through right. Amazon Amazon going up in value. So why worry? Yeah, if I had literally billions of dollars, I'd have one of those too, just because why not? Like, uh, uh, might as well. Why not? It's just like, do I? The way that right now I would be like, should I buy another package of like paper towels this week? I think I have enough for the week. Yeah, why not? What's what's fifteen bucks? Might as well. Who yeah. knows what could happen in the next week? I might make a huge mess. Like, <laughs> eh, yeah, sure, I'll take the second uh, second Lamborghini. Why not? That's I think that's how they think about it. I read a a, a sort of breakdown once that said the way that somebody that makes a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year might look at buying a candy bar on their way home from work. That's how much of a financial impact it would make upon them for a billionaire to buy, stop and buy uh, like a, like a Lamborghini on the way home from work. Mm. Like it would have, it would impact them just as much, which is basically not at all. So, yeah, I think that they're probably, they probably have tie-ins with a lot of, information sources and depending on how much of a conspiracy rabbit hole you want to go down the Bilderberg stuff and who knows what else they might know something that we don't i'm sure they do those same guys are probably the ones running the whole world anyway so maybe but uh i don't even think that they would have to to still want to build those crazy bunkers they could just go do it so it's interesting you mentioned about who's who's running the world um in my Googling around to have a chat with you and do some research, um, I, I bumped into the World Economic Forum and the concept of the Great Reset 2030. Um, and I, I'm probably not the first person to ask you about this, and I, I would guess that the look on your face means you know something about it. But, I mean, the, the idea of you'll have nothing and be happy, um, which is kind of one of the things I pulled out of it as like, that doesn't sound very great to me. Um, I mean, do you think that's a threat to our our normal, genuine way of life, or do you think it's just hocus pocus conspiracy online theories? Or where's where's where, where does that sit for you? Well, to be fair, I haven't read a lot about the Great Reset. I'm familiar with the term and maybe the just the sort of rough gist of it, but so I, I don't know that I am well read on the idea enough to to speak too much about it um is that is that what your take was on it that everyone will just lose everything and we'll just live as some kind of communal yeah it was it was getting to the point where with um that there's going to be a like a a clash in economics cultures and communities where uh, and um and technology as well so the, um, the the quantity of jobs available will go down because technology will take over the jobs, um, and um, th- therefore the most of the money will. Well, it doesn't say that in there, but in there, but logically, then most of the money will sit with the richest of the rich, 
it almost sounds like communism, actually. You know, the sort of um, oligarchs, in, oligarchs in Russia, and then the rest of the the rest of Russia, um, and that at some point in time, one of the steps towards it would be a form of universal base, basic income. I'm not against the idea. I'm just exploring, like, what does that really mean? You'll have nothing and be happy was was something that I read, and I was like, well, I. I don't know very many people who have nothing and do happy at the same time. That, that doesn't, <laughs> no. it, it sounds to me like that principle means goes against what I believe, which is, you know, control your own destiny, um, be, be responsible for who you are and your own future. You know, you could, if you work hard and do the right thing, you could build a future for you and your family, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then I started looking at the names of people who were involved in the World Economic Forum, and Mr. Gates popped up, and George Soros, and Mark Zuckerberg, and and um, and that just—I don't know—I don't know where it's left me. Um, but what they're effectively suggesting is the end of capitalism and democracy as we know it, um, like full stop, and. I can't see those two things coming to an end peacefully. Um, no. I, I can't see that happening. So, and equally, I can't see a body like the World Economic Forum publishing this stuff unless they actually have a degree of intent of making it happen. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not too sure where I sit with it, but it, you know when you read something and you leave, you leave feeling uncomfortable inside but you can't quite work out exactly what yeah. that's kind of the feeling i got off the back of it is this doesn't sit well this doesn't sit well with me yeah that's a tricky one that could go i think one of two ways i mean that maybe would be the 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 massive um sort of boiling point that could lead to actual uh uprisings of some sort whether or not they'd be successful Maybe that's why all those guys are building those bunkers, because when the poor try to, you know, hang their heads on a stick, they're going to escape to their their uh, safe haven. I don't know. Um, but what I what I think is. Um, and, and again, I can really only speak for America or countries that have sort of a similar system is that we want things to be the way they are. We want our way of life and whatever that means for each generation. Um, you know, sure, people uh, in war torn, uh, you know, Poland back in the 40s, like they would have loved to be happy with nothing because they were just trying not to die from something horrible. Yep. But your average, like kind of spoiled American like myself, mm, that's that's so that's such a foreign idea. To us. There's, I have no perspective on it. So for me, it's um, not having my house and my truck and my whatever I enjoy having. Um, and everybody I think needs to maintain, and that's why everybody goes so nutty when they can't get something as simple as toilet paper or go into a restaurant to get their favorite thing without having to change their, their face coverings or whatever they're used to doing or not doing. Um, and I have a lot of opinions about the government and sort of the string pullers, but ultimately a lot of the conspiracies theories don't add up because all those corporations and string pullers need us to need us to be living the status quo. They need us to kind of be fat and happy, complacent, entertained. Um, it doesn't behoove the puppet masters to mess with the system so badly that um, everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. They stop making money when we stop having money. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know what I think. I'll have to read a little more about it to, to maybe develop my understanding and opinion on it more. Uh, but in, by 2030, I, I can't possibly see unless unless we do get hit by the media or something. <laughs> well, and that was the bit actually that really jumped jumped out of out at me is is could I see the way of life in the world? You know, uh, democracy stopping, capitalism stopping. Could I guess that one day that may well check that may well change? Yes, of course I could. Um, but the 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 2030 number was like, can I really see that peacefully happening within eight years? Uh, you'd have to have COVID on steroids 
like far, far worse to the point where people are so threatened that they will do that they will agree to anything just to survive. That that seems to me like the only peaceful way you could achieve something like that, where it's like you, you do it our way or you're dead tomorrow, you choose. Then then I think they've there's a degree of leverage. Like you think, but COVID, I think people tried to portray COVID like that. And I'm I'm not saying that people haven't been sick, they haven't died, um, that it hasn't been horrific. But the level of of what some people have portrayed it to be, and then the reality of what it is, don't match. Um, it, it it wasn't terrifying enough where your life is in imminent threat, where you'd actually give away freedoms. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one too. There's plenty of people were and are willing to kind of forego a lot of uh, I don't know about freedoms, but their normal idea of things um, out of fear, or at least in trying to be part of the society that, that fixes it or whatever. But it also opened my eyes to just how many people there are that won't um, cooperate or, or believe in it or, or even entertain the idea of it. Um, even though it was very serious in a lot of places. So to kind of to, to add on to what you were saying is something that's serious enough that people are scared enough to where they're finally all agree to just anything as long as we're safe. I think that that thing would have to be so bad to get everybody on board that it would be bad enough to also maybe kill most of whoever the oppressors are too. Like, like the, the, the new super virus is so bad that like, we'd love to agree with you government if you'd save us, but Oh, most of you guys are also dead from this terrible, whatever it is. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and if all you have left are the billionaires in their bunkers, then what's anything matter anyway? Like even for them, they're screwed the second they run out of their beans or whatever they got down there. <laughs> it's interesting. It's also though human nature that we, when when something goes wrong, we actually want to rebuild back to a place of security and stability. And yeah. I think that our frame of reference of human beings actually isn't to go and try some new way of running a country or a ge- let's start even running a geography um, or yeah. I, I, I don't think that human beings are that. Um, I think that they'll actually look backwards and go, right, what worked in the past successfully? We we know that that's proven, like factually. It wasn't brilliant, but it's better than where we are today. And we'd prefer to go to like the, the devil that we used to know than the devil that we don't, I suppose, really, in terms of that decision making. And so I, I rather suspect that people would opt to go back to a a form of democracy and a form of capitalism because it, it's been around for well, for hundreds of years in the United States in terms of democracy and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years when you get outside of the, the US. Um, but capitalism has been around since the caveman. Um, if, if, if you think about it, like it's it's not a new concept. You know, it's it's I, I trade my chickens for your for your goat's milk. Do you know what I mean? It's that that's capitalism. And so I just think that people will go back to what they know and feel comfortable with. I don't think that they'll want to easily jump into some weird new utopian. Um, what's the uh, what's the film? Uh, oh my goodness me! With all the different zones, and they live in different zones, and then there's a battle. Oh, are you talking about the Hunger Games movies? The Hunger Games, yeah, that's it. Yeah, now, I I can't see people consenting to go into like a, a some form of Hunger Games or something like that. I can't see that happening. No. No, especially since I think the worst, most terrible place to live in that world was in like uh, what amounts to basically like Alabama and Arkansas or something. And they got more guns than any of the other states up here. So, like, I don't (laughs) think they're going to be the ones stuck at the bottom if everything really has to go that far. (laughs) That's it. Um, it. But but, uh, yeah, Um, I think, yeah, I think like what you said, people will. They, they want to rebuild quickly, but back to what they already know. 
and mm-hmm. and and probably what they know most recently. So we want to build every if something happened when you know there's a natural disaster, we want to build it back exactly to what was normal to us before the disaster. And maybe we'll try to add some new layer of something to mitigate the thing that happened from happening again. You know, if I lived in uh, Louisiana during the Hurricane Katrina back in the 2000s, I'd never live there again. What a that's terrible risk mitigation. Be like, I know we already lived below sea level and lost everything. But it's dry now. Let's all let's rebuild our house there. But no, the whole city's back and they built the levee a little higher or something. I don't know, but mm-mm. I, I really I really like Michigan because we don't have any natural disasters. You might freeze to death if you're not ready for it, but there's nothing else. That the, nothing that's going to get you. <laughs> so so we've, we've been down the rabbit hole of, of maybe some touching on some conspiracy theories or some, some maybe some realities as well about what the future may well look like and maybe what we should consider being prepared for. For the, for the average person who's like, yeah, I, I get some of this, but wh- where do I start? What's your best advice for those people? It's a great question. It's one that comes up a lot online and uh, a lot of different prepper people have different ideas about it, but here's mine. Um, don't try thinking about how can I survive off grid for, for 10 years? Think about what happens if you have a full power outage at your house or your neighborhood for 48 hours. And most people are probably half prepared for that right now. Um, yeah, I guess we got about three days worth of canned food and in the cupboards, even if it's stuff we don't want, like spinach or creamed corn or something. Yeah, we could live. Um, if it's the winter, can you heat your house for those 48 hours? Because you'll freeze in that amount of time. Um, maybe that means you need to get a small generator that'll keep your furnace going. Even if you're on natural gas, you still need electricity to blow, you know, turn the, the, the blower. Um, something like that. Uh, do you have... Do you always definitely, definitely have 48 hours worth of any medications you have, prescriptions, whatever, um, things like that, uh, entertainment, food, water, maybe self-defense doesn't really necessarily come into play when it's a matter of one neighborhood being out of power for a couple of days. And so that shouldn't be a long stretch to get from where you are now to being ready for 48 hours. Do you have two gas cans full of gas for that generator? Because mine at least takes about a can a day if I'm running it all day and night. Mm. Um, whatever you need. And then if you reach that point, which anybody should be able to with minimal effort, and you want to take it a step further, then you go to a week. And that's that's when you start you know, thinking about what if the municipal water supply is off? Or if you have a well and you can power the well, then you're fine or have some kind of hand pump. But, mo- you know, in the cities, everyone has municipal uh, water. If that goes, do you have some water jugs? The absolute minimum a person needs is about a gallon a day between drinking, washing, and cooking and whatever. And that's the minimum. Do you have that many gallons per member of your household for that many days? You know, so maybe you got to get a couple of big camping water jugs or something or, or barrels or whatever you can manage to, to do with your house. Um, more cans of gas, whatever. Um, so that's what I say, start for the 48 hours and then move to a week. And then, you know, you're talking canned foods, boxed foods, macaroni, rice, anything like that. Once you try to take that jump to a full month, that's when things, that's when you start to really get in. Now you're going to have to start calling yourself a prepper because you're talking about, um, you know, food storage now and, you know, a month worth of food. Almost nobody has a month's worth of food in their house. I know I could I could show you right now if I was using my phone instead of a computer exactly what a month's worth of food looks like. And it does not take up a small amount of room. And the water drums and gas cans, and you gotta start thinking about a month. That's a lot of stuff and a lot of learning how to take care of those things. You know how to fix a generator because they go bad if you don't maintain them. And it starts to get deep once you go from that week to month. So I'd say anyone that's starting from absolute scratch, look in your pantry. Do you have 48 hours worth of food that everyone in your household can eat, including your pets? Um, I bet I bet most people do, but it's not stuff they're going to want to eat. It's those just weird cans of whatever in the back of the cupboards that they haven't even thought about. Um, 
So pick up some extra cans of soup every time you go grocery shopping. Just two, two or three. Mm. Don't you don't have to hoard. You got to start somewhere. Um, but buy stuff you're going to actually eat. Uh, we've all kind of been through the experience of buying too much of certain things that expire and go bad long before we ever use them. Use stuff that you'll actually eat so you can cycle through it. Uh, especially if you're going to try to take that leap to the month. Um, and then it would take me, well, probably an entire YouTube channel's worth of time to talk about what to do for longer than a month. <laughs> well, I mean, after, as you mentioned, in the, when the, you had the power outage in the Northeast, um, you know, for, for 48 hours, worrying about protecting yourself isn't really very much of a thing you have to concern about. There's, but once you get beyond that two-day mark, um, the the either living somewhere that's remote where people don't know you're there and can't get to you um or or or, or staying living somewhere where you um can be protected within a community or, or something security actually does become a very a very real concern i mean it, it struck me here in south africa we've had uh, we, we've got very close to complete blackout um, on several occasions, and they say, it's, say it'll take six to eight weeks to regenerate the power grid again, where we to where we've all got power. So that's a, a guaranteed two months of no electricity. Well, the, the police have got families that need protecting. They're going to go home and look after their families eventually. They're not going to be at the end exactly. of a, a call. Um, cell phone towers. I found out only that the batteries in them only last for eight hours here without um, without power, and then there's no there's no internet, there's no cell phone, there's no, you can have a generator and charge your phone up. But if the cell phone tower is dead and flat, um, it, it's of no use. And it suddenly struck me that maybe losing the electricity grid is the biggest thing that any of us could consider as, as a problem we should prepare for. Because it's the thing that could tip a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, the ATMs run out of cash. You can't swipe a credit card. I mean, the, the list goes, I don't know what you think, yeah. but like everything that we're used to, you know, you walk in the door and flick the light on, but light doesn't work anymore. Um, the fan on the furnace, as you said, you know, there's maybe electricity is the thing we all, or, or lack of. Maybe that is the thing that we all need to focus on. I, I don't know. Well, is, is that your number one thing or... It's it's a big thing. I can I can live here just fine for a while with no electricity. But yeah, it's the broader if a whole society doesn't have electricity, um, people that have a million dollars are still going to starve because they can't use any of it to buy their food. If anybody could even sell food, which they can't. So unless you have something to barter and people that are actually willing to barter, which is going to be a tricky thing. A lot of preppers talk about you should stock up on items that you can use for barter. Well, once that happens, like, I don't know, I, I, instead of buying a bunch of cheap alcohol that I could use for barter, I, I would have just maybe bought more food in the first place. But um, yeah, uh, you're right. That all leads to hungry, desperate people and the uncertainty of if it'll ever come or when it'll come back on. Uh, and, and that does raise a big security concern. I know, you know, there's, there's a lot of that sort of defense and security aspect that a lot of preppers think about including me, I don't cover a lot of it on my channel because there's a lot, there's a lot of better channels that talk about that stuff than mine. I don't think I have a lot to contribute there that other people haven't already done, but, um, but no, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, defense guy. And, but I, I, I also acknowledge that, um, me with my rifle, uh, can, can, can do a lot for self-defense, but when there's three guys with three rifles, that's probably all it would take to really take, take everything that I have. So no, it's a, it's a scary aspect of things and it does make living out in the middle of nowhere attractive. Um, with the one obvious downfall of if society has not crumbled and there still is emergency services, well, now you live in a place that takes them an hour to get to if something does happen. <laughs> Yeah, that well, uh, legitimately, the nearest hospital to where I am now is um, if I drive really quickly um, and I'm like 80, 90 miles an hour taking some big, you couldn't do it in the dark because there's too many wild animals crossing the road. So, I mean, you couldn't do that. 
Um, and, and they're not like lions and they're not lions and giraffe. It's more like big ass elk and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? That just and cows. There's another great thing. But if I drive at 80 or 90 miles an hour, um, I, I can get to my nearest hospital in an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and but so it opens up another level of I won't say I don't want to say prepping, but another level of thought about what do I have on me? What do I have in my car? And what do I have in the house in terms of if I slip with my chainsaw, you know, and my wife needs to, my wife driving me to hospital would probably be the fastest way of getting me there. Well, I better have a tourniquet and I better have some plasma and I better have a few other bits and pieces because otherwise you're stuffed. Um, it's an awkward, it's, it's a hard one. And, and I don't think there is a right answer. I think everybody has to find their own right answer. Um, and, yeah. and that's going to be unique for all of us as to what our risk tolerance is, um, what our economic need is. I'm lucky I just need the internet for work. Um, other people need to turn up to a factory every day so they can't go and live in the middle of nowhere. That doesn't mean to say they can't prepare for something. No, that's definitely right. Uh, the, 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 the medical stuff is something that I spend a lot of thought on actually a little more each year that I get older. Um, since I've been in my forties, you know, and things start to go wrong or things, maybe I think things are going wrong. I have a little bit of a hypochondria thing going on and no matter what's wrong with me, I think I'm having a heart attack. And, uh, I've actually gone to the hospital before just to have somebody with a medical degree tell me, no, you're just stupid. You're not having a heart attack. <laughs> it's something else. And they can explain it. They gave me, you know, I have a, a prescription for uh, blood pressure and, and they changed the supplier who used a different type of inactive ingredient, which it turned out I had an allergy to. And all the symptoms of that allergy were very much in line with the symptoms of heart attack. So I needed someone to tell me that so I could stop freaking out. Well, if I live where you live, I need to drive an hour and a half. And if it is an actual heart attack, I might just be toast. So some of those things you just can't think about. And like you said, you have to weigh, weigh your own life, either risks or priorities. I want to live here. And I know that one of the possible downsides of that is this. So yeah, you have some first aid equipment on hand. You learn how to use it. Maybe even take some, some uh, uh, intermediate first aid courses, something. If it's going to be the, the big uh, widow maker heart attack, uh, you can't first aid your way out of that. So is it even worth thinking about that hard mm -hmm. if you're going to live where you live? Um, or uh, I guess get a faster car. I don't know. But what do you do? You can't think about it or else you'll drive yourself crazy. Uh, and, and that touches on something we, we started on a while back is focus on the stuff that you probably can control or, or at least help fix. Hmm. And, and there's a lot now. One one of my other, <laughs> I won't say whether it's funny or bugbears. I'm not really too sure. But uh, it's, I, I bumped into somebody who was who uh, actually described himself as a prepper, and he had a, an, an amazing selection of, of seeds. And his intention was to, you know, if everything goes upside down, that's it. He's going to be growing his vegetables and whatever else. And um, I asked an innocent question, but I, it was along the lines of um, how long do your potatoes take to, to go from being chitted a seedling to, to harvest? And then what, what are we eating in between times? And it, it struck him, but equally struck me at the same time. You know, this, this prepping thing actually is, it, it's, it's a way of living life sensibly where you, where you increase your level of control over your life. Um, and chickens and goats and uh, cows and vegetables and whatever else, they, they can be an, a, a thing that you can do. But as you said, with the homesteading, it's a lot of flipping work and you can't wait for everything to go or, or for something to go wrong and then go, yeah. now I'm going to plant lettuce. <laughs> no, it's something you have to have already started. If you're not in the, in the club, uh, by the time you have to be, it's too late. Um, and it's an unfortunate aspect of it that the people that drives a lot of the people to become homesteaders or preppers or whatever, because they, they want to be in it before they need to be in it. 
uh, because if something really severe happened and stuff really did break down, um, we I don't even think us modern spoiled uh, humans can even really grasp how much death and despair there would be. Uh, maybe even for the people that started early enough, because are they just going to be overwhelmed by the hungry hordes? I don't know, but they're going to have a better chance anyway. Uh, but yeah, that's a common one. Some people say, well, if everything goes down, I'm just going to head out to the woods and I'll just live, I'll live in the woods and hunt deer. So, okay. Well, you've never camped a day in your life and you've never hunted a deer and you don't know how to gut a deer. And uh, a thousand other guys who do know how to do all that stuff will be in those same woods and they'll probably have to end up eating you because they'll run out of deer. Um, same with the lettuce. Yeah, I, I grow a garden every year and I have for many years and I'm still, I don't even know, maybe not that great at it. I'm okay, but something goes wrong and I don't know what to do. Like you could lose your entire uh cabbage harvest for the year some new mite that you've never encountered before or bug or worm um it's a lot of work and you got to prepare a year in advance if you don't have a home depot or a garden center to go to to buy your fertilizers or whatever you have to have had a compost operation going on for the last year to have enough to actually feed your vegetables that you're going to plant next year and, and by the way those seed kits they're super cool and I've, I've had a couple over the years but seeds have a shelf life and it's not that long. Um, every year, about half of those seeds are not going to germinate. So if you get an awesome kit with 30 different vegetable varieties and you got 10,000 seeds, um, if, if you don't plant those within about four years, you're not going to get anything out of them. Um, so the only really w real way to sustain it is to plant those vegetables every year and learn how to uh, basically harvest and preserve the seeds yourself from each new year's th so uh and that's 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 even over my head i don't i, I don't even take it that far because uh i've never spent the time to learn all of it tomatoes, um, tomatoes are really easy and peppers are really easy because the the seeds are very very obvious but uh when you get to something like um what was what have i been playing with recently basil or basil uh, depending upon how you pronounce it and and lettuce Harvesting those and carrots, my gosh! Harvesting, oh, seeds. Yeah. oh that's uh, I've been I've been messing around with it for the past six months, and um, yeah, I I'm, I'm still not there. It's uh, yeah, hard. Those seeds are so little that I have a hard time seeing an individual seed with my naked eye. And mm. I don't think your average person has ever seen a lettuce seed. Like, how does a lettuce even seed? Most people probably don't even know. <laughs> well, if, uh, we, we can tell them that. So for that bit there, the, the lettuce, you just let the lettuce grow too long effectively and it changes right. and flowers and then there's some seeds, but they're, they're microscopic. I mean, you, you can't measure it. In, you can't measure those things with any imperial. They're in like uh, 0 0.01 <laughs> of a millimeter sort of in metric. Do you know right. what I mean? Tiny. <laughs> um, yeah. I suppose the other thing, though, that, that there's there's an upside to all of this. If if I look at my, I'm now I'm now my vegetable garden now is quite new, so it's it's not going to produce much this year because of the move I've made. But if I look at my um, food bill over the past couple of years before, as as the veggie garden and the chicken thing got bigger, and uh, I've taken up hunting as well. Um, and and my my food bill, you know, yes, you buy sugar and flour, um, rolled oats, you know, stuff like that that you can't easily do in enough volume and process it yourself that easily. But apart from that, like I'm I'm, I'm now having to buy vegetables for the, close to the first time in three years. Um, wow. I bought eggs the other day. I was like, what the frigging heck am I doing buying eggs? I don't need to, I've never bought, have because we're getting new, we've got new chicken, <laughs> little chicks that they'll lay in 20 weeks or so. Um, you know, and, and suddenly the food bill has become very large. Um, you know, I moved house with an empty freezer, which means that we'd finished off the, the deer that I got last year. Um, now I need to go harvest another deer. And so, so we're buying meat again uh, in yeah. in a quantity. 
And you know, this, this prepping thing, once you get into it, it actually can be a way of saving you vast quantities of money if you're prepared to do the work. I mean, it's a gift, really. Yeah, it just depends kind of how you approach it. Um, there's plenty of people that want to just buy their way into feeling prepared. And you can do that, and that'll help to some degree. You can buy the Mountain House brand of freeze-dried food that's super expensive and fill your whole basement with it. Um, or you can put in the work and learn how to do a lot of stuff and make have the garden and go hunting. And uh, I want to have chickens so bad, and I'm going to have them hopefully before too long. Uh, it's there's not a great it's, it's not a great spot in my current property for it. So I'm, I'm hoping to relocate before too long definitely gonna have chickens uh but no you're right um during the harvest times of the year or if if the vegetables i have are something i can preserve which many of them are yeah i, I never have to buy uh tomatoes anything tomato based really except maybe if i want a fresh tomato i can buy one of those bland tasteless uh, hothouse tomatoes for a sandwich or something in february uh or, uh, you know, so much of the stuff you can freeze or can or dehydrate. Um, yeah, no, you're totally right. You, you can save a lot of money. You got to invest a little money and a lot of time. Hmm. Um, but it, yeah, it's definitely can turn into a way of life for sure. And at that point, I don't know what separates you from a, a farmer or a homesteader. You're just, you're not a prepper now. You're, you're just, that's your life. You're, you're just, that's the way you live. So um it's i don't know it's just a, what's in a name it's all the whatever labels we decide to call it uh i think there's a lot of crossover in all of it i do i i think that there there really is i think that the um i think that the more aware somebody can be um about the the reality of how the world works so as you said, you know, supply chains are very, very short. You know, um, the, the truck arrives at 10 a.m., but at quarter past 10 in the morning, they've already run, they've run out of milk. But luckily, the truck was there 15 minutes before. Um, when you start understanding that stuff, and then, you, and then you say, well, what if there's only one supermarket in my town? And what if the truck breaks down and is four days late? What about milk? Um, when you start understanding some of that really very basic stuff about how how the world works forget macroeconomics and politics and all those other things and just like the rudimentary stuff suddenly you realize that we're we're all living in an environment that's far more fragile than maybe we've ever stopped and thought about and then maybe that's enough motivation to go do something and buy some long life milk to put in the cupboard or I don't know, learn to, learn to drink your coffee black or whatever it may right. well be. Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, you know, in our, in, in my grandparents' times, every household or maybe not every household, but every town was almost like it's uh, self-sufficient entity. It was its own sort of Island in the world. And uh, I don't know, maybe there was something beautiful about that, that they didn't have constant information from the whole globe hitting them. And they, they, they lived more contently not having that, but, every household was like almost self uh, self contained with your own animals and your own well and your own uh, just everything um, or, or maybe your town, uh, every, everything you needed kind of was there and there was a community, but no, now the, 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 the supply chain and the, everything's very reliant on quote the machine. And there's no way around the fact that modern first world way of life is absolutely just uh, on a house of cards. And yeah. I just really hope that we've got a lot of good people, you know, building the card house. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, you know, we're, here we are in end of 2021 and we like to think that everything's so slick and organized and whatever else. And yet you have a problem with your, if you've got a job, you have a problem, have a problem with your computer and you call the IT support person and and the first thing they ask you to do is turn it off and turn it on again as though that's the and and so maybe we're not as sophisticated and advanced as as we let ourselves believe you know if the solution to fix your computer is turn it off and turn it on again um maybe just maybe there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on um and 
maybe capitalism's got a lot to play a part to play in that um in, in terms of people want your money um so they're not going to let you know what what's what the truth behind some of the logistics of your food is for instance because um then then you wouldn't rely on it so much and maybe you would be more self-reliant and they wouldn't make as much money it's very yeah very the, interesting. The, the, i got a lot of i got a lot of opinions about the entire food supply of course you know it, it concerns me that uh, so much of the things we eat, so much of our food doesn't really seem to be made out of food. Mm. Um, like if you buy a frozen meal, like from the grocery store and it's got all the different ingredients, you're making some big elaborate pasta thing, but it's all in a big bag and you just heat it up. Like on the picture on the thing, you see, you can make out a mushroom and a little piece of beef and some stuff, but then read the ingredients in the, half of the ingredients are things you've never heard of words. You can't pronounce like, and that's just the stuff that maybe they're telling us about or fast food. You know, Taco Bell is huge uh, uh, in, in the U S I don't know if they have a huge presence elsewhere, um, but they get in trouble with the, uh, the, the federal sort of um, food administration because they can't legally call the beef they put in their tacos beef. They have to call it meat. And then a few years later, they got in trouble because they couldn't even legally call it meat anymore because it didn't have enough high enough percentage of meat in its in its makeup. And so they started doing these independent analysis of what appears to be ground beef. And it was had wood pulp and I don't even know, probably kitty litter and soylent green. in it. I don't even know what was in it, but only like 20 percent of it was meat. And they had to start calling it taco filling by, by the legal definition. Like, okay, so our food's not made out of food. Mm. Uh, and, and it makes, I like to challenge people for, for one week, try to eat nothing except ingredients that you can identify. And usually that means buying fresh produce and meat and butter and stuff like that and making a week worth of food yourself. But then don't try to buy no condiment that has a bunch of stuff in it that you don't even know what it is. That doesn't count. It has to only be stuff that's real food. And, and, and I definitely still eat food from restaurants and I eat, you know, potato chips, which probably have all sorts of godforsaken preservatives in them. But I've moved big time towards the eating food that's made out of food uh, in, in, in the stuff that I make myself. And, um, and I'll, I have a lot of recipe videos and it's just, it's like real food mm. uh, and, and, and homesteaders of course are all about that because they're making a lot of their own food. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And your, your channel seems to have got uh, very heavily skewed towards food generation, preparation, canning recipes. Um, is that by accident or is that just by following what it is that the viewers want to want to engage in the most? Um, maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I think that mostly I just kind of make the videos that I feel like making and the stuff that interests me. And I find that as time goes by, I'm just personally a lot more interested in the, uh, in the sort of food science stuff and, uh, um, being big in, uh, in, in cooking and I know cooking videos don't really necessarily fit on a prepper channel, but I don't have a cooking channel. So that's where they go. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and there's I'm just gonna keep making more and more of those and and I may split it off into a separate brand at some point but uh, the canning videos mo seem to be maybe the more common ones um, but I don't know if that's just because I make more of those than other kinds of videos um, yeah it's it's it, I don't know if I can find any rhyme or reason to how YouTube decides which videos to sort of show to more people and therefore they get more popular. And, my number one most popular video is um, how to make and can salsa, mm. uh, like a chunky ordinary salsa, and it's it's delicious, but it's just a basic sort of walkthrough of how to make it and can it. Um, and a lot of people are interested in knowing how to do that. And then uh, you know, so so yeah, I think uh, so. I started making more canning videos of different kinds of food because apparently people. Are, uh, want to learn about doing it. So I like doing it. They want to learn about it. It seems like a perfect match. Yeah. And this, um, 
it's amazing what happens to your health as well. But uh, when, when you st- when you take that challenge that you mentioned and you just you just consume stuff that you actually can recognize, you know, uh, maybe you don't even buy ground beef. Maybe you buy the the sirloin or the backstrap or whatever it may well be and grind it yourself. I mean, if you want to go that, so you, you actually can say this this really has come from a piece of a cow. It hasn't just been in a packet, you know, um, right. where well, you're not too sure what's been added. Um, you're speak, speaking personally, my, my health has improved dramatically through, through that. And it's not like I was unhealthy before it's things like clarity of thought gets better. Um, energy levels increase the need for sleep decreases. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting what happens when you change what you shove into your body. Um, and your mental health gets better as well. I mean, it, it's it's quite remarkable. And I, I think more people should, if you don't want to be called a prepper and you don't want to prepare for something, maybe just maybe just eating really good food and looking after your health is preparedness all on its own. Um, definitely, for sure. Um, the Any food that you buy that's the final product, be it from a fast food restaurant or a bag of potato chips or junk food or pre-built meals. They're unfortunately designed by corporations that have a profit motive and need you to keep buying more. So yeah, of course they're filled with, and in the U S it's a big thing. Everything's made with, uh, what is it like hydrogenated, uh, uh, corn oil or, or yep. um, corn syrup. And monosodium yeah. glutamate says to go and make it taste better. And sure. Yeah. yeah. But all the every sugar has been replaced with corn syrup because corn syrup is cheaper and does something in your brain that makes you addicted to wanting more of it. The sodium, the fat, all the things that taste delicious but make you feel terrible, but make you want more of it anyway. Um, that's our whole, you know, industries are built on that, and they're going to keep doing that. And well, if you're a capitalist, it's almost hard to blame them, except the obesity epidemic and everything. So yeah, when you make your own food, um, there's a it's a different kind of 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 satisfying, and can be just as delicious. Um, heck, you can even make your own potato chips. <laughs> it's just not convenient to do so. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You need a lot of potatoes and a lot of time and patience. In fact, actually, if you make your, I've tried making your my. Have you tried making your own potato chips? Oh yeah. Is uh, I, I often find by the time I've made them, I don't want to eat potato chips anymore. I'm like, I'm, I'm over that bit. <laughs> I'm done. I'm thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> you got to make them and put them aside for the next day or something. <laughs> That's it. So tell me, you, your your channel's booming. It's increasing in size. You've topped the 20,000. Um, what can we expect next for from Great Lakes Prepping? Like, What have you got coming up that we can all look forward to enjoying? Well, the winter months are kind of a lull for my channel because there's not a lot of people gardening. There's not a lot of people trying to can their garden harvest. Um, And it also means that it's the time of the year where I can't garden and I don't have a garden harvest that still needs to be canned. Um, Sometimes there's a little bit uh, in terms of hunting. If I, you know, if I can, if I get, uh, I have a successful deer hunt, I'm actually still in our deer hunting season now. So I still have some of that to do. Um, hopefully I'll, I'll have some good venison videos coming up. Um, but these months are often when I start getting more into the cooking videos, just because it's something I can always do. Uh, I'm more interested in cooking elaborate things in the cold months for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, it just seems like it's time for comfort food and soups. I'm big into making the soups. Um, so the next few videos are are pretty heavily cooking. Uh, cooking related and they might be for for a couple months um if i can set up this new property that i've been kind of working on for a while uh it'll probably take the shape of maybe more of a homesteading channel Mm. uh uh, in terms of the the garden operation and and if i get any livestock and that kind of thing and um i can really there's a there's a million uh, possibilities with that um whatever it is that I can make that happen. Um, but yeah, sometimes I don't really know what the videos are going to be until, uh, until I decide I'm going to do, I got a list of, of videos I want to make. That's always growing. And I, whatever 
week I get the the inkling to make that one or that one or um yeah, maybe there should be more rhyme or reason to it, but I guess there's not. <laughs> oh, that's that's fine. That's fine. Um that's fine. That's cool. Thank you. So um final question. Um you, you you've got a good heart and, and you want to see the people in the world thrive. What's what's your message message to all of those people who've what listened to this from a prepping standpoint? What would you ask of them to go and do in terms of an action going forwards? For other preppers or for anybody? For anybody, I think. I mean, most people who listen to this are, are going to have an inkling about prepping, but don't really do very much. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. If 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 you're already a prepper, then you you either agree or disagree with everything I've already said. Uh, if you're not really, <laughs> if you're not much into preparedness, but it interests you, just start, just do anything. And, and everybody got a kind of a, a light taste of what things, where their weak points were over the course of the early pandemic, you knew what you didn't have and you knew what was going to run out at the stores first. Um, it's, there, there's, there's so much stuff you can't prepare for. And, um, but there's a lot of stuff you can prepare for normal stuff. Uh, and if, and if it's something you want to do, then you're going to be in a better position than, than probably still most people. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money to get started. You just gotta, just gotta start with, start with that 48 hours. Um, and there's a world of information online. You can learn how to do anything you want. Uh, if you really like the idea of, uh, canning your own fresh vegetables, you can learn how to do that. And if I don't have it on my channel, somebody else is going to have it on theirs. You, you, there's no excuse for not knowing how to do something these days. That's mm -hmm. the one, that's the biggest thing that our sort of decadent technology driven life of convenience has provided is this uh, immediate accessibility to basically all of humanity's knowledge. And, uh, and you can just learn anything that you feel like learning. On demand. Yeah. I love it. Well, so thanks so much for your time today. Folks, if, if you've got this far, which I hope you have done, um, there's a link below and probably one in the top of the screen here somewhere that somebody will put in for me to the Great Lakes Prepping YouTube channel. Go and check out their um, the website as well. There's recipes, there's advice, there's guidance, there's articles, there's loads of really cool stuff. And um, I, I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming there's other Instagram and other sort of platforms as well where you can, can follow them. Um, and uh, I haven't used your proper name once in an hour and a half, which is, is good. I'm quite proud of myself. So uh, GL, thanks so much for your time. And I look forward to a, a round two one day. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. And I appreciate being on your, your show here. And, and uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. <laughs>